So back in 2018, we rolled out the coin tray. It was like $20. We dropped it from 20 marked down to 15, from 20 marked down to 12. It's getting attached to more orders. It's driving up AOV and we've meaningfully increased conversion rate. But there are millions of dollars in wallet revenue now that we can basically attribute to uh, to use your term, price market fit on the coin tray in our add to cart upsell. Dude, we're starting to see something similar with, we now sell watch display boxes. They either hold three or five, and we're really trying to upsell those because we see when people buy those, they'll come back and buy more watches more often. Something that we've been really focused on this year is like, what can we sell you today that'll increase the chances you're gonna come back at some point? Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Nate, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. It's a guy that I've learned a ton from in this industry, and if you've been sick of hearing me yap for the last seven episodes, it's going to be a great relief for you. He's uh, he spent many millions of dollars more on ads than me. He's made way more than me, and uh, if you're listening to this, then you know who he is. The host of the Marketing Operators Podcast and the CMO of the brand formerly known as Ridge Wallet, now known as The Ridge, Connor. What's up, man? How are you? Dude, I'm doing good. Doing really well. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, dude. Thanks so much for coming on. This whole podcast set is fake, actually. This is just free consulting for me. So super <laughs> excited for you to fall <laughs> yeah, for that yeah. trap. Yeah, that's, yeah. How, that's how marketing operators works, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, man, this episode is all about chasing what I call price market fit. Um, I think it's something that's overlooked a ton in early stage e-com brands. Everyone knows you got to find product market fit, but a great product at the wrong price doesn't sell. Um, that's something that we kind of uncovered in the last couple of years. We've been price testing religiously, um, and it's unlocked massive profitable growth for us. Uh, I wanted to have you on cause you've had the unique experience of selling wallets for a long time, but you guys have also now branched out into luggage and rings and knives and even watches because you're trying to take my job apparently but um <laughs> would love to hear your kind of perspective on on how you guys even start approaching how to price products when you launch into these new categories totally well yeah we'll have to circle back because i've got a i've got where we've created the most value in terms of price testing has really been around within the EDC category. It's just mm -hmm. gotten so much more nuanced over the last couple of years that like we found a lot of like small optimizations that have really compounded nicely over time. In terms of new categories, it's really interesting. Our uh, like foray into travel, for instance, has the most simple premise is we want it to be a more masculine way. You can look at a uh, uh, a Bayes, a July, a Monos, in a way, all nine figure D 2 C brands, all like to some degree kind of female uh, leaning. Obviously, both uh, appeal to large markets, sure. but we thought there was an opportunity to take like the a, a more masculine Yeti like approach to the luggage industry. Um, so, from a pricing perspective, we just wanted to land in that realm, right? There are like three hundred dollars suitcases. We're on the slightly higher end. We're at three forty five currently. Um, but we feel we've got a great product. We wanted, you know, a certain margin profile so that we, co we could acquire customers. And that's where we landed currently. Um, for rings, slightly different. We're actually kind of on the lower end. We've got a base $175 tungsten ring. We've got um, 24 karat gold and platinum tungsten rings at like a 295 mark. Those get discounted a couple times a year. So we're actually one of the more affordable players in that space if you compare us to a, uh, a manly band or a ring bearer or something like that. So the new categories, we've frankly done a lot less testing and, and uh, finding the right place for us right now is probably more like the product market fit versus price market fit. We haven't like fully optimized True. those lines of the business. Um, but how we get there is really just kind of mapping out where the industry is and kind of where we think we can sit. Awesome. Love that. Now let's go back to the everyday category, uh, everyday carry category. Then you said you spent a lot more time testing there. Yeah, totally. Because for context, we just launched travel in November of last year and we launched rings the November before that. So I've been here eight years. Ridge has been around for 11. Uh, so those categories have been around for like less than 10% of the, the, the life of the company. Um, when it comes to everyday carry, so we largely sell wallets. We're known for the Ridge wallet. Um, we have some accessories. So we have like a key case, which is a key organizer. We have pens, we're coming out with carabiners. We have phone cases now. And that's kind of like a mid-tier price, $40, $50, um, complimentary items, things that you carry with you every day. And then we have uh, 
smart wallet accessories. So quick draw where you can hold your ID on the front of the wallet, air tag options. We've bottle open so you can slide into your wallet. So those are those are our three categories. And you can stop, stop me whenever you'd like, but I've got I've got <laughs> no, good examples go of unlocking seven figures in value within each of those. Um the first one, when I began at Ridge, our aluminum wallet was $65. We had solid margins at that rate, but we felt given kind of the innovative nature of the product, the high quality materials, the lifetime warranty, our 99 day risk-free trial, we felt we could move up market. So over time between 2017 and our last kind of price test was uh, 2020 probably, we went from 65 to 76 to 85, and then finally pulled the trigger at 95, which I think is a really solid entry price point for a premium wallet. But that is a massive increase. That's a 40, yeah. 50% increase. Um, in that time, we drove COGS down. So massive margin expansion allows us to acquire customers way more profitably. And that's really like the main lever that we were looking to create. This is our CAC product. This is, a, this is a product that we are acquiring customers with. We need a great margin profile and we like slowly tested our way up to increase our AOV so we could tolerate that. Um, so that's one, which is like super simple. We raise prices over time. I think a lot of founders miss that. They'll yeah. forget that for whatever reason, whether it's brand or for us, it might be IP, our focus on design, the way that we market, et cetera. We actually have the ability to increase prices. We don't see a, uh, proportionate decrease in conversion rate. So we're just unlocking value at each of those steps. Uh, and I think a lot of brands still kind of have that opportunity. So that would be step one in terms of a key to our success is just that straightforward price increase on hero product, expanding margin, allowing for higher CACs and scaling the business that way. Let me uh, double click on that because we've also gone through a period of raising prices in the last three to four years. And I look at it from kind of a couple different perspectives. We both run businesses that have to be profitable on acquisition. Repeat orders happen, but it's not. We don't sell supplements or any subscription brand. When a customer comes to us, forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn, but you expect them to never buy again, right? Right. Right. So, yeah, basically. Um, do you think part of the success in raising prices is more that uh, everything's getting more expensive so we can also afford to? Or do you think just getting more expe expensive has allowed you to scale so much because you can tolerate a higher CAC now? Like, is it yeah. more macroeconomic stuff or is it more just the economics of Facebook ads where if you let your CAC get up, you know, 20, 30% higher and are still more profitable per order, then that unlocks big growth? Well, it's a bit of both. I mean, our our increase in price from 65 to 95. And again, that, that came with like a massive investment in product. And we're really proud of the consumer experience that we offer. So we thought that we could continue to kind of back up that higher price point. We were like, if you were to benchmark us against like inflation, we were like outpacing inflation. 2017 yeah. to 2020 or so. Um, you guys were just early the, to the inflation. We were part. early to this. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I'm with you. Like I, I we recently... Um, I use ChatGPT for this, but marked like Ridge Wallet price increases alongside like Big Mac increases. Like the mm. Big Mac index is a very famous way for people to like measure inflation, right? Or what well, we were looking at the Ford F 150s, like a way more expensive car than it was like a decade ago. Yep. Um, and we were we were kind of ahead of the curve in that sense. So we were like out, outpacing uh, price increases. Um, but now it's kind of leveled out. I actually, to your point, like, yeah, whatever, it's like, 450 for a fish fillet at McDonald's now when it was like 99 cents a couple of years ago. Now $95 is probably more uh in line with the price of other things. So inflation has caught up. I guess is my short answer there. Um the second is yeah, we were outpacing inflation so basically we were giving ourselves like a disproportionate benefit when it came to tolerating higher CACs. We've known for a very long time or we've operated the business under the assumption that over time CAC will go up and yep. acquiring customers at scale will get harder and harder. So one of the main ways you can break that diminishing curve is just by increasing prices, increasing margin. And that's, that was our focus for a very long time. Price is one, but like I said, we, we brought down cogs. We've been ruthless with like shipping costs, any variable costs. We want to drive down low so that we could tolerate increasing prices and a more saturated and mature market across meta and other, you know, digital channels. Awesome. When you guys were going through this period of aggressively raising prices, were you looking at profit per session as the North Star or were there any other metrics that you were looking at to prove that this was working? 
Yeah, it's it, it's essentially like like contribution margin per no, it's yeah, it's profit gross profit per session. Uh yeah. we weren't really looking at like cost per site visitor. You A B test it so that we could just split right. like, hey, the basically the cost per visitor is the same on both sides of these segments. And if we're seeing a you know, if we're testing a twenty percent price increase, are we seeing a smaller decrease in conversion rate that it's allowing us to to unlock profit? So that's really was our, our key KPI in in that instance. Awesome. Cool, cool. Well, so the yeah, go ahead. Can I get to the, yeah, yeah, yeah? Please, sorry, I interrupted you on point one. So sorry about that. Go ahead. No, cool. No, I'm 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 happy to double down on that. My second one is my favorite one, uh, and it's it's the least impactful um, for the business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have a, I think we we have an innovative premium product. Like we are able to, for many reasons, able to command a high price point as it relates to wallets. Um, as we expanded the everyday carry category, I think we kept a similarly premium price point on our other items. So I'm going to talk about pens now, which I've talked about on marketing operators a bit. Sean, our CEO, hates when I talk about pens because it is a seven figure business. So it's not uh, it's not insignificant, but as a percentage, it's a it's a very sure. small percentage of our total revenue. Um, so pens, we had at seventy five dollars, and you know we were kind of like this was. 2022, um, when we were thinking at this and we were just like, Hey, what are, what are other kind of minor optimizations or adjustments that we can make that can better align with what consumers are expecting for us? And what I always say is like $95 or our AOV on wallets is like 120. We have $150 carbon fiber and, uh, NFL wallets that are higher price points. Um, that's the most expensive wallet. Most guys buy themselves. Uh, like it's definitely not a, a, um, impulse buy. Pens are $75. That is far and away the most expensive pen the vast majority of people are going to buy. But so is like 59 bucks. Like $59 is still premium price pen. And I'm like, what is the what is the price elasticity on something like that? So incredibly simple test moving the opposite way. And one of the big reasons we were able to do this is we don't really pay to acquire pen customers. We're not mm -hmm. trying to tolerate a higher CAC. We're trying to get higher adoption of pens attached to wallet orders or wallet customers coming back to purchase more items from us. So it's basically, let's just call it a, a $0 CAC product. Um, so we said, hey, you know, one segment, same thing. We used IntelliGems. Uh, on this side of the segment, we have $75 pens. On this side, we have 59. Uh, it's roughly a 20% decrease in price, we saw a 50% increase in conversion rate. So we're able to massively increase the amount of units sold for a relatively small decrease in price. And we're able to like get close to doubling pen revenue essentially. Uh, and that was one of my favorite ones because it's so low lift at that point. We're driving yeah. the same traffic in the same way. Our CAC on our wallet products more or less stays the same. All we're doing is we're increasing the adoption rate and increasing LTV by better aligning pen prices with what people are willing to pay. And that really hits the point. I hadn't heard you say um, price market fit, I mm. think is what it was. Like, that's what I felt like we were kind of like working our way towards. Internally, I've actually been like, we should really think about a $30 pen. That's still yeah. an incredibly expensive pen. It's a still cool from an everyday carry in a brand perspective. We can make a cool polycarbonate pen, something like that, probably get even further adoption. Just thinking about how price elasticity can change by product given your brand and audience, I think is cool. And that was a, maybe not a seven figure unlock, but a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue that we basically were able to just create by uh, adjusting this, this price 20%. Yeah, dude, we've seen the same thing with, we sell necklaces and bracelets and pendants and None of them really do anything, but where the unlock has come from is in upsells. Um, right. Cause now like, again, we're assuming CAC is the same, but we can extract an extra $4 per order of profit. Like that's a big deal to a company that needs to be profitable on acquisition. And uh, our most recent one, we kind of went into like a product development meeting to create an upsell product. Like that, that was the sole Dude, goal totally. of an, of this new SKU. And we came back with flasks because our best selling watches are inlaid with whiskey barrel wood. And uh, so now we have a 15 or $17 flask uh, to attach to every whiskey barrel watch order. And the take rate's insane. And those flasks cost us a couple bucks. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's like actually making an impact. And I don't think a lot of people think about upsells as part of the acquisition offer. But it totally is. Yeah. yeah. What I talk about all the time, I laid this out earlier. But I say it about basically all of our categories. We have our CAC product, wallets. We have really relatively small 
accessories that we upsell. So like our air tag attachments, our coin tray, that's like a 10 to $17 purchase, something like that. And those are getting attached to like 20, 30% of orders, really high adoption rate. And then we have that, that kind of second tranche of products, which is pens and key cases, carabiners, and we can slowly kind of upsell people in steps. Like that's kind of like the sequence yeah. that we've thought about. So what I always say, like for travel, I said the same thing. I'm like, what is our air tag attachment? And what is our key case of travel? Travel is a great category because it naturally has an ecosystem. We have our Keck product in the luggage. The equivalent of the air tag attachment would be our packing cubes, which we get adopted on, on a really high percentage of orders. And then the key case equivalent is uh, the check-in. So we get like almost 50% of all carry-ons have a check-in attached to them. So now we're talking about massively inflating AOV. And that goes back to my earlier point where like, if you're, go if you're going to assume over time, CAC is going to increase because things get more expensive and you're gonna further saturate audiences, you need to be doing everything possible to be increasing margin, increasing AOV, and those small upsells and like finding that price market fit within those so that you can get as high of an uh, adoption rate as possible, I think is like just a big lever that people might not think of as as granularly as they can. Yeah, dude, everyone's so focused on decreasing CAC all the time. And I think it's kind yeah. of a fool's errand. Like I, I don't, I, first of all, I think it's hard to do. And I think the impact isn't that drastic because you probably won't be able to unlock another level of growth. Whereas like just focus on increasing AOV and LTV. I think it's one easier and two, you'll feel more compounding effects of growing the brand from doing that than decreasing CAC by a few dollars. 100%. And it's like, that's a great point. Like I think at any given time, this is totally true of Ridge where we have inefficiencies in our marketing mix that when addressed can lead to lower CACs. And we have every incentive to try to find those and cut those out. And like, of course, every marketer should be doing that. But even then, okay, you've reduced CAC. If you want to go out and grow 20% next month or next year or whatever, CAC's going to go up. It's yeah. almost every single time you should assume that CAC's going to go up, even if you've figured out how to reduce it in the very short term. And that's why like, it always comes down to reducing variable costs, to expanding margin, to increasing AOV via upsells and attachments and kits. Yeah, love it. All right, that was point two. You've got a third one for me? That was point two, yeah. So point three, and these are maybe a little bit out of order. I could have followed this one with wallets, but I that's mentioned right. um, our, our these like smaller accessories that we get really high attachment rates on. Um, the first one we ever launched was called the coin tray. So. The Ridge Wallet's a minimalist metal wallet. It expands to hold one to 12 cards. Uh, it's got a cash strap or money clip on the back. So you've got cash, you've got cards, no room for coins. For some consumers, it's important that they have some way of carrying coins or some people put like guitar picks in there and just like small little knickknacks, whatever you want to carry with you. Yeah. So we launched dime a coin bags. tray back. Hmm? What? Sorry. I didn't say dime bags. Did you say dime bags? <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. We don't, right. we don't judge our, our customers. Uh, so back in 2018, we rolled out roll out the coin tray and to to for context the average experience at the time was you're on a wallet pdp you're clicking add to cart we've got an add to cart upsell of the coin tray i think at the time it was like twenty dollars or something and we saw a couple things one we saw a pretty good adoption on that coin tray i don't have the numbers off the top of my head but yeah. let's call it like 15 percent or something um <clears throat> so okay cool awesome 15 percent of people are attaching it those people actually, and we we set up um, GTM events so we could see, we could like segment for people who added that item. What we yeah. also found were those 15% of people who were adding that item were also converting at a higher rate. And actually, for the sake of this story, the numbers are not perfectly accurate. The item was discounted. It was maybe like uh, $15 marked down from 20. So let's call it 25% off. Uh, it's 25% off. People are attaching it at a 15% rate. Those people are going on to convert at a higher rate awesome right you've like essentially increased conversion rate we have uh for some amount of people we've addressed a concern that they had and i think that can be one way you explain the conversion rate increases someone was initially concerned about not being able to carry coins now they have less concerns they can convert at that higher rate uh so awesome that totally makes sense we've driven up aov we've increased conversion rate very simple price test that has led to a really meaningful increase in revenue is we dropped it from 20 marked down to 15 from 20 marked down to 12. So it was just a slightly bigger discount. Instead of 25% off, you're getting uh, whatever that is, 30%. Uh, what we saw was we saw attachment rate go up. So it goes from 15 to 25% or, or something, um, a pretty meaningful increase. And all of those people 
continued to convert at the higher rate. And this is what I was like super interested in was um, it would have made total sense to me that if, hey, if we if we drive up attachment rate 50 percent, we're probably not going to see that much larger group of people now convert at that same higher rate that they were before. But we actually see that exactly maintained. So now all of a sudden it's getting attached to more orders. It's driving up AOV and we've meaningfully increased conversion rate. I want to say at the time it was like a blended 8% increase in conversion rate or yeah. something because we had a more price accessible item that addressed people's concerns that they were able to easily attach and then check out with. And so what I say is, we do whatever, like a, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in coin trays. Um, those coin trays have effectively sold more wallets. <laughs> That's crazy. So it's, it's, That's it's hard to crazy, like, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to perfectly attribute. I, I maybe have tried it at, at some point in the past. Again, this was like a 2018 example, but, um, but there are millions of dollars in wallet revenue now that we can basically attribute to uh, to use your term, price market fit on the coin tray in our add to cart upsell. And that's like I said earlier, they've compounded over time. And it's like, yeah, we've we learned that lesson once and we've applied it in many new ways over the last, you know, five that's or awesome. six years. Dude, we're starting to see something similar with we now sell watch display boxes. And uh, you know, they they either hold three or or or, or five. And we're really trying to upsell those because we see when people buy those they'll come back and buy more watches more often because they got to fill the box totally. and like i i think that's a, a another thing that gets overlooked when crafting acquisition offers you can create offers that increase ltv and repeat purchase rates and i don't think people again are structuring offers like that i think everyone goes immediately to a discount 30 percent off 50 dollars off whatever it is but something that we've been really focused on this year is like what can we sell you today that'll increase the chances you're going to come back at some point yeah totally so we did that i i had a very similar thought like years ago and we built a valet train we still have it today um which is like a small like desk organizer and it's got a couple slots for your different items and we put two spots for wallets and it's like <laughs> i was like and i was thinking i'm like dude look i think this could be an incredible way to sell a second wallet to someone they've got they've they know where it belongs like on their desk yeah. it hasn't really penciled out the valet trays are awesome products i'd also put them in that bucket of pens or coin trays where it's just like it's only one skew. There's a certain type of customer who really likes it. We're able to discount it. it becomes a great offer. Uh, we haven't seen it necessarily lead to growth in LTV, but I love that way of thinking where it's like, how can you kind of guide consumer behavior via smart offers or smart product development? Yeah, that's awesome. One thing that we've done this year uh, that I love free consulting on, we have uh, we've been giving away a free fifty dollar gift card with a ton of orders, um, and we've seen that cohort of customers come back and buy twice as often as any other acquisition cohort. Um, and what's great for us, like we, we can't get screwed on that deal. Like if they come back, they have to use it on a watch or cheapest watches are 150 bucks. Right. They only cost us 30 bucks to make. Like we still profit on that next order. Um, and was wondering if you guys have done anything as, as, as a brand where repeat orders don't come naturally is there anything kind of like in that vein uh that you're having success with getting the people to come, come back on well do you so you said 50 dollar uh gift, gift card. cards yep and how does that get delivered it, do you have that in like uh, the acquisition email. offer where you're like or is it post-purchase uh so for father's day and valentine's day we promoted it as the acquisition offer um, this summer we have not been promoting it. So it's a surprise and delight in the post purchase flow. And I did that because I, I didn't want someone to come through and see the offer only buy one watch when they were always planning to buy two, but separating it into two orders and like kind of totally. ske skewing the data. So now we're not even promoting it, but we're doing it. Um, and the LTV res results are still super strong. Yeah. So we have done a similar thing. We do like our, our LTV offer is what we call it. And it happens basically in the first like three weeks post-purchase. We started with a $40 gift card essentially. Um, and I like the way that you guys have done it. $50 only applicable on certain products. Cause we were like $40, but it's on orders a hundred dollars plus it's the same yeah. sort of idea where it's like, we can't lose money on that. Um, and we do try to make it like a, thank you so much for joining Ridge. Like we're building yeah. products you're going to use every day. Uh, we want to make it easier for you to carry more of those products. So here's like $40 off a hundred dollar plus. So exact same idea as what you're describing. It's been massively effective, just increasing 
cohort values that along with thoughtful product development and price matching or a uh, price market fit on pens and things like that has been yeah. like a one, two punch we found uh, effective. We did end up moving to 40% off hundred plus. Like we a B tested that, which feels even less like a gift, right? Like a $40 gift card makes total sense. We're saying like, Hey, you get 40% off hundred dollars plus, but we saw a higher AOV come through. We saw people convert at a higher rate. So that's actually our current okay. LTV offer. Um, and yeah, for a business that you were talking about, we're both in this, in, in this situation, but, uh, for us, you know, most guys only carry one wallet and ours is guaranteed for life. There's really very yeah. few reasons why you'd come back and purchase a second one, especially within like two or three weeks of your initial order. Right. Uh, so it's like, how do we, how do we more aggressively incentivize the purchase of these, these complimentary items? And, uh, yeah, we, we found ourselves in a very similar position to what you described. Awesome. Well, I want to, and uh, sorry, I'll, I'll interrupt you quickly. Cause I asked about do. the acquisition offer cause we haven't tried promoting it there. And I was, I don't know what would be best. I'm super curious to be like, Hey, if you buy today, you get 40% off your next order, hundred, hundred dollars plus, or maybe we just make it super simple. You get a $50 gift card today. Um, we it see, converted well, like really well. It worked well. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. we did see like, even just offering it in post-purchase, we see a very few people like it's definitely not in that it's nowhere close to a net negative but we see people try to return their order and then repurchase with their gift card or they'll be like they'll respond to our customer service emails and be like can i just apply it to the thing that i just ordered and we have to kind of talk them down from that but um yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a difficult kind of line to, to walk trying to do any sort of aggressive offer that's close in time to when they initially ordered yeah we made sure to pr promote when it was being uh you know shown in ads on our site we said buy a watch get a free 50 dollars gift card to use on your next watch purchase right so we kind of put the two qualifiers of like hey you have to buy a, this to, to get it then you can only come back and use it on a watch i'm sure there's a handful of people that snuck it through and returned the watch and then totally bought again but it's what it is but if you see but yeah 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 but ultimately like i mean we have millions of customers like so few of them are bad faith like you can totally get right. screwed sometimes but by and it's large it's not gonna I think, happen like, at scale yeah totally and if it makes any sort of meaningful impact on conversion rate it's just like you'd have to have a lot of bad faith customers for it to be yeah. net negative yeah for sure all right can i move on yeah yeah you good all right i want to talk about specifically this q4 uh november and december coming up it's where a lot of brands will do you know 50 percent of our revenue for the year in q4 um, what kind of big changes do you see or, or what levers are you getting ready to pull as buyer behavior changes from maybe, you know, it's guys buying from th for themselves for, for most of the year in Q4, it's going to shift to a lot of their wives and girlfriends buying as a gift for them. Do you see big changes in what your acquisition offers and discounts and bundles have to look like to kind of meet that change in buyer? Yeah. So I'll say historically. There aren't big changes in offers. Like what we end up doing is uh, we end up doing, it's not quite site-wide. It used to be site-wide. Now we hold some of like the more recent stuff at full price and it'll depend on category and things like that. We'll do roughly 20 to 30% discounts, a little bit higher for certain kits across the site. And then rather than offers changing by like demos or, or who's purchasing, it really just comes down to content. So we've been here a long time. We've had a lot of big Father's Days, a lot of big Q4. So now it's just a matter of how do we, how do we properly prep from a creative and landing page perspective to speak to these different people at this time of the year? Um, what I'll also call out is, I mean, we did this years ago. I think it's getting more popular now, but we don't use codes. So we'll do markdown pricing codes end up not working during this period. Um, and that allows us to do that difference in pricing. You know, historically someone might say 20% off with, with, with code holiday sale or whatever. Uh, we found it advantageous to remove all of that, make the actual discount and savings that much more obvious, no friction in checkout when you don't have to apply the code. And we can kind of, um, guide where volume goes by marking certain items down further. So, we're like finalizing all of our pricing right now. Things that we are over inventoried in will get a larger discount than some of our core SKUs. It'll also change throughout the period. So that is, that's how I describe like our historical offer. Honestly, not all that complex aside from like, it's a ton of creative and landing pages and planning yeah. from that perspective. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And then what I'm excited about this year, a couple changes that we're making, we're going to, we like, 
reset how we're doing our, our main kit. So our most popular kit is a wallet and the key organizer, both items like super applicable. They're both kind of, um, incremental to what someone typically carries. We're not like replacing anybody's key organizer. Um, and we reset it so we can get that offer closer to a hundred bucks. And I think that could be really, really, really impactful. So that's one is what is it at now? It was at one forty five basically. And then we oh, removed so you're some items it down uh, quite a bit. Well, so it's a, it's a, it was at 145 a couple of weeks ago and it had more items. We removed a couple of those items, moved it to 125. And then during Black Friday, Cyber Monday, we'll move it to like 99 bucks. Okay. Um, and th also kit pricing is something that I will definitely be testing over the next couple of months to make sure we're like as refined as possible. I could see it working really well, at like 119. But um, yeah, coming, coming down significantly from like 150, uh, I think could be really impactful. We found for gifting that like hundred dollar mark is just like a, a sweet spot. Um, so that's one, what we're also going to do for the holidays, which we just came out of our leadership meeting a couple weeks ago. And like, this was a big next step that we're going to hustle on to get done for this Q4, but custom gift bags. So something that like looks somewhat seasonal, someone might find value in being able to wrap it, put it under the tree. And more than anything, I think from a creative standpoint, it could crush just immediately on the nose, put someone in the mindset of like, this is an awesome gift. They've got a hundred thousand five star reviews, millions of customers. I can imagine how those boxes go in that bag under my tree and my husband's going to be super stoked. So I think that could be an example of just adding this like very small item can have a really big impact. And I'm like speculating a little bit here, but um, I think it could be something we, we could be very surprised by. So those are the two updates we're making to this holiday sale. We've got a bunch of others, but those are the ones that I'm maybe most excited about. Awesome. Yeah, dude, the content thing this time of year, I think is huge. This week, our photographer is in studio with a full living room Christmas scene with a tree and stockings hanging from the fireplace and watches wrapped up. And we've seen like such a big switch flip on like November 18th where that content and ads just absolutely starts crushing. Totally. So is it November 18th for you guys? I guess another big update is, uh, we're launching our sale on the first. Okay. See, so we're not going to start yeah. that early. We're not going to start our sale until the 12th, which is what oh. we did last year. But what we did last year, which I think was a mistake was, we started, we didn't call it Black Friday, Cyber Monday on the 12th. Are you going to call yours Black Friday, Cyber Monday on the 1st? I'm, I'm calling it. I'm super interested to get your thoughts on this. I am no, calling dude. this yeah, the go ahead. better than Black Friday sale. Uh, okay, cool. Where the offer is going to be our normal prices, but you get a $100 gift card free with purchase when you buy a watch. On Black Friday, that'll drop to 50 so it is a better deal, but we're trying to pull as many kind of like repeat customer orders early uh, so we can scale up ad spend and not totally kill our blended metrics. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I like the strategy. Looking back at our data from last year where we made the mistake was we didn't call it Black Friday. Like we didn't, we didn't really mention Black Friday pricing, even though the offer was largely the same throughout this whole period until the week of Black Friday. So we People were going to just- thought it was going to get better, so they waited, right? Yeah, totally. And you can see it in the data as soon as we, sorry, my dogs are barking. Uh, you can, you can see it in the data. Like as soon as it's like, oh yeah, this is black Friday. Now prices are essentially the same as they were yesterday. Sales up 25%. It's like, okay, yeah, let's just pull all that messaging forward. We'll be more aggressive earlier in the period. That's our main adjustment from like a, a timing perspective. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Well, I know we're uh, wrapping up here. I'm going to ask you my favorite question to end an interview on. What do you wish I asked you? What am I missing? What were you hopping on this call? Like, man, I can't wait to talk to Nate about this. I think I, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for you because I'm so stoked talking about these small, I think you asked me exactly what I'd like, wish I talked more about. Um, oh, so I, I don't have anything that I, that I wish we talked about. It's just this thing. Like, and I think it is a, uh, it's kind of like my OCD brain a little bit, but like, I'll give you another pricing example, just for how granularly I think about this and how interesting I think it is. And ultimately so impactful over time, but we have, we have $125 NFL wallets. We've got $150 carbon fiber wallets. We've got a uh, $125 leather wallet. And we have some titanium wallets that are just below that. And I'm like, these don't make sense. Like these are just, these aren't right. Like these aren't like right sized. There's, I don't understand why we have this $25 difference or $10 difference on the low end, but properly testing it. I was like, there's a million dollars to make here. Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's exciting for our scale because like 
small adjustments like that. Like, hey, let's we laid out like three different segments of like how these different things can be broken out. NFL can go up, leather could go down. It could be all these all these different scenarios that play out. And nailing that correctly can be a massive improvement. Um, so yeah, anyway, at your scale, I, I mean, a two percent increase is a huge deal. Um, right. At, a, at a, our scale, we need a 10% increase to get anyone excited. But like still, when I don't think we've ever had less than a 10% swing either way when testing prices and offers. Like I think it's a really impactful way to kind of get data. Totally, totally. So um, so yeah, you asked me everything I, I wanted to be asked. And overall, I'm just like always super down to geek out on like uh, <laughs> kind of minute price testing. Yeah, awesome. Well, if you guys want to hear more about Connor geeking out, you can uh, follow him at C O U U O R on Twitter. Is that right? Yeah, it's like the, Connor, Connor with the ends upside down. Yeah. And then uh, Marketing Operators Podcast everywhere, newsletter everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the plugs. Hell yeah. Awesome. We'll put all your links in the description here, this layer, sometime in the next month or so. But Connor, thank you so much for uh, coming on, man. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me, dude. This was super fun. Thanks, dude. Talk soon. Thank you all so much for listening to another episode of Triple Whale's 10 Tactics to Master Before Q4. I was incredibly uh, fortunate and lucky that we were blessed with Connor's presence today. That guy is maybe one of the most analytical, smartest minds in, in e-com. So if you don't follow him, please go check him out. And the stuff we're talking about with testing offers and prices on acquisition can truly be game changing to your business. I really can't stress it enough. There's only so much tweaking you can do in your Facebook ad account. There's only so much you can do from a retention marketing strategy, but I've been able to see in the last three years heading up marketing for original grain that, you know, testing prices 10% up and, and down can increase conversion rate and increase revenue per session by 40 or 50% every time you do it. So it's been massively, massively impactful. And it's let us grow uh, by more than 60% for two years in a, a row now while increasing our margins and increasing our overall profitability. So please take everything he said to heart and make sure you guys are chasing after price market fit as we approach the gift giving season. Thanks so much for listening. There's a couple more episodes coming your way with some other awesome guests. So I hope to see you guys back here soon.